Welcome to the Sacred Window Podcast. My name is Christine Devlinek. The Sacred Window refers to the tender, magical, and remarkable weeks following the birth of a baby. A birth giver is forever changed. Recognizing that this time is too often overlooked and misunderstood in our modern culture, we're setting out to be part of a voice for change and growth. We're growing awareness and broadening the reach of conscious postpartum care. Our podcast features friends and colleagues as interviewers. We're a loving community united by a common passion to change the paradigm of postpartum care to one that honors women, birth givers, babies, and families. We're glad you're here. And I will never be the same. I think we were talking, you know, when I first um, saw your video at the birth summit or on the birth summit, I just, I just had this like sort of electric feeling of like, oh my goodness, like here's somebody else, you know, who's really thinking about this on a whole new level, not really new, this is such ancient knowledge um, that's so deeply connected to just, you know, um, just like beginning of time almost. So I was very excited that you're you know, talking about it with a wider audience. And I'm wondering if you can, we can just start with sort of setting the stage and like, just hearing about like, where you come from, your family story. Sure. Um, yes, just the my people, uh, people are the Anishinaabe Ojibwe's and I'm thankful and very lucky and blessed to be able to live on my ancestral territorial homelands here in the Great Lakes in, in far northern Michigan. And the Anishinaabe mm. people, they're also called the Three Fires. There are three tribal nations that consist of these Anishinaabe people. So we believe that we share the same ancestors, we share a similar historical context, and we believe that we're all related. So there's the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And we all share ancestral territorial homelands here in the Great Lakes region. And the land and water that we live on and still live on today are really foundational to our culture. Where we live, if you were to look at look at a look at it on the map, you would see that we're surrounded by what I believe is the largest amount of fresh water in the whole world. So we have five Great Lakes. And like Lake Superior is the one that I live closest to. And there are really sacred and important waterways that are actually central to a lot of tribal nations that have served as trade routes and travel and trade routes throughout all of history for a lot of people around the whole world. So it's a very significant place for us to be. And my work that I'm able to do and the perspective that I teach from and share from, it comes from a land-based perspective. So we're still very much connected to our land, the practices that we're able to preserve and engage in and reclaim and revitalize some of the ones that have been lost over time are very much rooted in who we are and the place that we come from. Yeah, I think that that really just um, spoke to me so much because for a lot of us, you know, we're, you know, very far from our land. Um, you know, we don't recognize the kind of the land we're in. We spend so much time away from just that essence of where we belong and who we are. And I love that the work you're doing is so rooted directly in your land. Um, I'm curious, sort of, how did you? sort of come to this work and you know did you always kind of have a sense of connecting you know your land your ancestors and the healing medicine it's been a long uh, journey and a very interesting in, in sort of origin story for myself because when I was growing up I was the only Native American person in my family so my mother is mixed European our Dutch ancestors on that side of my family came to the so-called mm -hmm. United States in 1920 
and started on the eastern seaboard and then worked their way across to the Great Lakes region where my family made their home. And I was always like the brown one and the dark one in the family. I would always ask my mom if I was adopted because I'm like looking around at all these white people and I'm like, I, this is right. Like I know there's something different about me. And I always had dreams and visions of ancestors and I felt really connected in that way, but I didn't have the language to really fully root myself into my identity. And it wasn't until I was 13 years old when my mom would like finally confided in me that I had a different dad than my sisters and I was like I suspected all along I was Native American and so I finally got to connect to my tribal roots and start to learn more about my culture in that way and my mom did her best as a white woman to share as much as she could she had been gathering up for many years a lot of resources that she was waiting to share with me and then when I went to college, straight out of high school, I connected to a Native American Student Association on campus. And it was really mind-blowing because I grew up in rural northern Michigan, where I was like the dark one. And, you know, in the realm of people of color, I'm pretty fair-skinned. Mm -hmm. So that tells you exactly what kind of community I came from. And so my mind was blown because being raised and socialized in the public health you know, in the public school system, rather, you know, you, you believe that Native Americans like stopped existing at some point in time because we're spoken of in the historical past. Like we don't grow up with role models. We don't have contemporary stories of indigenous people. I didn't know. I thought I was just like some, you know, relic, you know, and I, I didn't know that where I lived, literally I live in a state where we have like 100,000 plus indigenous people and we have 12 federally recognized American Indian tribes in our state alone. So we have really high numbers of American Indian people where I live. And so when I get to college, I'm like, oh my God, there's other brown people. Like there's other, I actually didn't know that. And it was shocking to me. And so that was about, well, that was 12 years ago. And so for the past 12 years, it's been a deep dive into everything that I could learn about my culture. It's really sitting with teachers, mentors, learning directly from the land, from the plants and the trees and the land, doing my own prayer and ceremony. So it's been a decade long process of reclaiming these practices. But my initiation into birth work started around that same time when I was in college because I had my first child right out of high school. And when I went to college, she was five months old. We packed everything up, brought her with us. And that set in motion, like a lot of birth workers, my interest in learning more. Because my experience was less than stellar, birthing in the hospital, being a young brown mom, uh, being very inexperienced, not very knowledgeable in my own cultural ways pretty knowledgeable because I was very smart, very driven, you know, very educated, but I was educated in this Western model, like this medicalized model of birth. So I suffered a lot of complications after I had my baby. I had a, you know, I wouldn't say it was a traumatic birth, but it was a traumatic postpartum, the way that I was treated and cared for rather not cared for in the hospital in the moments and days after I had my baby was very difficult. And so that was my initiation, like my sort of trial by fire. You know, I had to learn how to get myself out of that dark place that I went to after I had my baby. I had to learn all of the ways that I should have been cared for and learn how to heal all of the harm that had been done so that I could take upon myself the mission of helping to prevent that harm from falling to others. So all of this sort of comes full circle to the work that I'm doing now where I teach and provide postpartum care that's rooted in my cultural traditions because it became like so important to go back into our stories and 
ask, what are these traditions that we can provide to others? Like, how are we supposed to conduct ourselves after we have a baby? Like, what are the ways that we can recover from childbirth, which is something that's so invisible and so missing, even in the realm of birth work? So I actually was initiated into birth work as a labor and birth doula Mm -hmm. through a major doula training organization. And it just wasn't the right time and place for me to do that work. I worked with teen and young college age couples who were having their babies and it pretty much just replicated all of the stuff that I had gone through in my own birth and wasn't really healing for myself or my clients. So I left that world behind and I dove into postpartum breastfeeding because I find that my energy is better spent there. And, and also because I have children of my own, it was hard to be on call in such, um, and, and it's hard to be complicit in the abuse that you see that that goes on in the medical industrial system when it comes to birth. So it's been a lot of ups and downs. I eventually went to graduate school to earn a master's in public health. So I have a strong public health background and I worked as a program manager in maternal and child health for several years before quitting my job to stay home full time with my kids and pursue my own business. Yeah, wow, it's a really powerful story. Um, and what you said about, you know, your experience in the medical system really resonates with me. You know, I'm a nurse, I've worked in the medical system. And, you know, I think there's this sort of um, dissonance when it comes to healing um, and healing in a medical system. Like, you know, you can maybe fix traumatic wounds but I don't know if that's really a space for healing and connecting. And, um, you know, a lot of sort of, if you look at medical guidelines, postpartum care is non-existent. You go to your, you know, doctor six weeks, you get one appointment and you're done. Um, And I feel like there's just sort of a huge opening, all this fluctuation change and, Maybe birthing parents just don't know how to integrate that. There's no ritual around it. There's no ceremony. Um, And what a shame that we're just sort of, you know, this huge void that we're sort of intentionally almost creating. Um, I wonder, you know, if you can speak about, because I, I, um, at, in the talk, I heard you say, you know, breastfeeding is a digital download from our ancestral wisdom, our ancestral lineage. So that idea that birth and postpartum can be this portal into a deeper connection with our ancestors and almost a space for yeah, healing. Absolutely. Um, and I'd love to hear. In my online course, from. we'll dive really deeply into these concepts and it'll be the very first thing that we talk about because it's important for us to understand that birth is spiritual and everything that happens in the physical realm within our bodies within our relationships to each other to the land this is a direct mirror reflection of what's going on in the spiritual realm so coming into this work you have to have a belief that the spiritual realm exists and that there is a veil or a pathway between us and the spirit world And we believe that this is where we go. We travel down when we're born and then we travel back when we die. And there are times in life where we actually stand at that threshold and we can be more vulnerable to slipping into that other side if we're not taken care of in the right way. Postpartum is one of those times because we go down that pathway to find our baby and come back. And this is in the moment of birth when this happens. So we take this immense spiritual journey and then we return and we believe that that portal stays open for the first four to six weeks after the baby is born. And the reason is because every ceremony that starts 
has to also end. And so when we open up this huge spiritual energy, we have to close it too. And it takes time to do that. It takes intention. It takes conscious energy. And it takes the help of our people because we're not meant to do this alone. And we need this connection to our traditional foods, to the plants and trees that come from our lineage, because these are the things that close up our body. Our body becomes a very open state after birth. And in some ways, it stays that way until we're done breastfeeding. So this is really the heart of the postpartum care from my ancestral tradition. It's really focused on the herbs, the trees, the traditional foods, and the practices that ground the birthing person into their identity to keep them here and like tell them like your journey here is not done yet you know don't be tempted to go into that other pathway because it would be easier to do that right life here is hard it's difficult we face a lot of challenges having a baby is hard work man but we need them here. So we're rooting that person into their identity. We're feeding them the foods that remind them of where they come from. We're activating the resiliency that exists within their DNA. And it's like giving them a hug from their ancestors, the the foods that we prepare and the ceremonies that we provide at that time. And they need that because they have to be as present and available as possible to care for this whole new being. And we're really supposed to be living in community where everything is done, everything is provided for. And that baby and their birthing parent can simply exist and be present and really sink into their new identity. We don't see the baby as being separate from their birthing parent. We see them as being one unique being for that very first sacred window, you know, that first sacred four to six weeks. And then they'll slowly become their own being or they'll rather be new because birth always and we want that to be as gentle (laughs) and honored as possible which is really the heart of the work that we do in that time yeah this i mean it sounds to me you know this is sort of activism of the highest spiritual sort um you know, this culture we live in sort of prizes you, you know, there's sort of this urgency maybe to get pregnant, you wait the nine months because we have to. Um, And then you have the baby and you have to snap, you know, into your previous, you know, whatever skinny body that that's sort of the language we use even. And it's just this, um, it just makes me really sad that we don't get to digest this experience and you know make meaning out of it and there's just so much pressure and I wonder do you see a connection you know that that kind of culture to postpartum depression versus how you're taking care of birthing parents the sort of the cocoon you're building and just like what you're saying we have to mother our and we have to care you know that is our duty as our community just those those cultural, you know, contrasting philosophies. Yeah, for sure. And it's a very sensitive discussion. You know, I'm I'm not here at all to gaslight people and tell them, oh, postpartum depression, it doesn't exist. And it never existed in antiquity, because I believe that it has always existed. However, I think the extent and the degree to which we see like these hugely high rates of postpartum depression, in particular amongst communities of color, because we do have this big disparity, which means more people of color are going to get postpartum depression than white people. And so it kind of makes us wonder how many layers our people have to get through in order to find that peace, that healing. And The absence of postpartum depression doesn't mean that there's not darkness, that there's not difficulty, 
that there's not tears or sadness or anger or grief. Part of what we want to strive for in the postpartum period is an integration of everything that it means for us to be human. And I believe that why we see so many people swinging way in the other direction is because we're not able to access and integrate what that means. We don't even have the language. We have like a deep inner DNA knowing, but it hasn't been activated for that person yet. And so for some people, these practices are preventive of postpartum depression because they are they just they are able to sit with and marinate in and just be fully present and allow everything that needs to flow through them to do so in a healthy way and in a supported way you know we don't run from that darkness there is darkness in the postpartum period you know this is something that i always share with people is that you're going to cry probably more than you ever have this could be like the best days of your life and especially if you feel good and supported and you feel cared for and you're free of pain and free of infection and you're able to breastfeed with ease and abundance but having a baby also stirs up all of the wounds that you're carrying all of the, you know, the the cuts that have happened throughout your entire mm-hmm. ancestral lineage on both sides of your family. You know, we could be feeling things that we're not even aware of. But the postpartum care that I teach and provide is that we can sit with that, we can make space for that, and we can know that we're going to make it out the other side. And so it's all about just allowing that energy to flow where it needs to go without stifling it. Yeah. Um, When you said, you know, there's a lot of grief that comes up about the loss that, you know, we may not even know why we're feeling that grief. Um, You know, what comes to mind is just sort of, um, you know, the American history of how Native American communities have been separated, you know, from their medicine, from their land, from their knowledge, all these, you know, tools, the beauty, the ecology. I'm wondering, you know, how did you find that connection? How did you kind of, you know, weave this knowledge and how are you? Yeah, you know, sort there's of a few, it? you know, sort of mm-hmm. introductory mm-hmm. practices that we can use and draw upon to connect to our own medicine. And this is something that I teach my students. I always say that the medicine's always in us. And there's just a few things that we can do to access that. One of those practices is our own prayer and our own personal ceremonies. So dreaming, visioning, you know, using traditional tobacco, which is something that I'll show you how to do in the class. These are things that are always available to us, but because of colonization and because we have this unique history where in our community it was actually punishable by law to practice our own religious protocols up until 1978 which was just yesterday like literally you know this is our parents and some of us we have siblings who were alive at a time when it was illegal to be who we are so a lot of our stuff went underground or it went in the back room. You know, people would do our religious practices and protocols, but it was in secret and they had to make substitutions. And so a lot of it is entangling what is ours and what we want to keep to move into the future. And it is just being able to go into that dream world and bring back what we need. A lot of that work actually comes from the medicine itself. So when I say medicine, I'm talking about the plants, the trees, the land. The more we can have relationships with plants and trees, the more knowledge we'll be able to reclaim because we believe that all of those plants and trees are spiritually alive, spiritually animated, and energetic. And they are able to communicate to us if we allow ourselves to become open to receiving 
their transmissions. So you could today pick up something from your ancestral lineage, meditate on it, pray on it, sit with it, get to know it, keep it by your bed. If it's, you know, say it was cinnamon, you know, you're going to just hold it in your hand, look at it. You're going to smell it, see how your taste buds start to activate when you just have it near you. You know, that cinnamon's going to teach you something before you even drink or eat it. So a lot of the work is actually just getting out there and using your hands and all of your senses to simply be present and be open to learning. A lot of it comes from sharing with each other. So the beauty of all, the, all of these classes that are popping up everywhere and all of these communities, especially now that we're all connecting virtually because of the context of what we're living in right now, is that we're all sharing and learning from each other in like really epic and amazing ways. So when we come together in online classes or when we're able to come back together in community, each one of us shares a piece of the puzzle to our whole collective healing. So you'll bring something, I'll bring something, someone else brings their story, and together we start to reconnect all of this knowledge. Because so much of it is very similar across cultures. And it's, it is within us, those memories are within us. And so it just takes the time and the space as well as a you know knowledgeable facilitator to stir that up and then people are like remembering oh yeah my grandma did this but she never told me why or we had this medicine in our family but I never knew what it was for or like oh yeah I've always been able to talk to the trees but I thought I was crazy and I'm Oh, you're not. You're just very spiritually connected, and these are messages that you need to pay attention to. Start <laughs> writing them down. Start praying over them. So there's a lot of ways we can reconnect to our medicine, and there's no right or wrong way, and there's no one size fits all. It's just a unique, individualized, personal journey for each person who's walking that path. Yeah, um, I think epic would be the right word in this moment to just describe, you know, what we're experiencing, the feeling, and the connection. Um, that's what I'm so touched and moved by. Um, I, you know, when I heard you talk, you talked about, you know, sort of the Anishinaabe traditions and sort of the philosophy of postpartum care and, um, you know, some of the factors that are essential. And to me, I was just going, whoa, that, you know, that to me sounds just like Ayurveda. A lot of what you were saying, it just resonated with me so strongly. And I think that sort of highlights what you were saying. This is universal, you know, our primal need to heal has similar modalities, but, you know, our land is different, our language, the plants we have, the earths we have. Um, I'm curious if you can talk about, you know, your traditions and, you know, what is most important. Yes. Yeah, so the foundation of the care that we provide is, like I said, it's a land-based protocol. And so everything comes from the land. And everything is also rooted in our kinship laws, our natural laws. And what that means is that we all have a responsibility to take care of each other in ethical and responsible and honorable ways. We believe that we're all related and we all are responsible to each other. So we have a very community or kinship based way of looking at the world. And so every person that comes across your path, you're responsible for. So now that I've met you, I'm responsible for you. You're responsible for me. And so we can see that every person would be cared for throughout every phase of life and in particular in postpartum because it's such a vulnerable, raw, but special and amazing and wonderful time too. You know, we tend to have this really deficit-based look at postpartum like, oh, it's so hard, you're in pain, you're bleeding, you're breastfeeding and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, but it's so much joy too, you know, it, it's so much joy. And so we want to protect and preserve that as much as we can. 
So yeah. everything should be taken care of for the new family. And I'm not just saying for the mom and baby, but for the entire family unit to just be present and enjoy this time. Because six weeks goes by in the blink of an eye. And then you'll regret that that time's already passed. You know, time flies by so quickly. Moments are long, but the, you know, the days go by really, really quickly after you have a baby. And we really focus on allowing and supporting and encouraging that family to be together as much as possible because the baby depends on their birthing parent in particular for their entire survival not only their survival but their ability to start waking up to who they are as an as an Anishinaabe person right everything they're learning they're learning from their parents and their family so we want to keep them together as much as possible for the birthing person it's really important that they stay warm so warmth being one of the foundations like one of the foundational wellness practices because we believe that everything has a spirit and a place and time to be used so no offense to cold we love the spirit of cold we call it but we try to avoid letting the fear of cold come to the birthing person. We want warm, warm, warm. And warmth means like literally their body is warm. They're protected from any coldness in the environment. We feed a lot of warm and hot foods and drinks. And they take warm baths every day. They, you know, they're clothed appropriately. They're with the baby, so, you know, the baby and the the parent are like little heaters for each other. And we give warming foods, meaning these are foods that are actually stimulating to the body. And when you drink these things or eat them, you can feel like your blood starts flowing and you just have that warmth from inside. It also has to do with the warmth of how we treat each other. So... The ways that we interact with the birthing person is very, very critically important because the spirit of cold exists in cold, you know, unkind words, uh, unwanted or sudden touch, you know, that scares them. And this is like the standard of care <laughs> that is you know, very common in a lot of institutions. And, and, and in particular in hospital settings. And then when they get home and there's people coming in and out, opening the door, they're reaching for the baby, they're just doing the most. And then we're sending them home with padsicles and ice packs. And so everything is cold, 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 you know, cold in how we're treating them. And then literally their body is cold. And that creates a lot of damage and it can take a lot of time to heal from that and bring warmth back to the body. So it's warmth in the environment and warmth in the food, but it's equally as important that we treat them with a lot of warmth. So a lot of respect, a lot of love, a lot of care is given to them. We never say any harsh words. We never judge or offer unsolicited advice about their parenting. You know, everything is done with the utmost care and intention. And it's and it's a consent-based relationship. So I wouldn't come up to you and your baby and touch your baby without your consent. I wouldn't come up and give you advice on breastfeeding unless you had first already asked me for it and you were open to receiving what I have to share. And so it's all about respecting that. And I think that's part of what we've gotten so far away from is that we've kind of mechanized birth and breastfeeding and we've kind of taken the human experience out of it it's like how can we get the baby out how can we get the baby latched in the first hour like it has to be in the first hour and like we'll do anything to get the baby out and anything to get the baby latched but we forget that there's all of these other aspects to how we can get there and that it's a not a destination and these are humans that we're talking about and we don't want to lose yeah. our humanity yeah it's um you know it's such a results driven 
you know, culture in that way in birth. And there's such a time crunch for it all. But I think what you're saying is we all have this sacred intelligence. Mm -hmm. It just needs the right environment to bloom, to awaken. And, you know, a lot of heat, like you're saying, consent, love. It's almost like you're coaxing mm -hmm. healing rather than here you go, here's a remedy that I'm going to slap on. Yeah, for sure. Because I Yeah, and, you know, pastacles, that's like a thing. And, <laughs> and it's not surprising because it's so normalized <laughs> and people, like, if they know <laughs> one thing about postpartum, it's padsicles or ice packs. Like a, a lot of first timers, you know, with all the love and respect in the world, they come into birth. They don't know. They don't know anything about what to expect afterwards. They don't know that they're going to be bleeding. You know, like we don't have, we don't have a lot of discussions and we don't have a lot of role models to draw upon to like know what birth is supposed to look like and feel like and definitely don't have a lot of context to draw upon for what happens after the baby is out and so people don't know that they're going to be bleeding they don't know that the placenta is a thing that comes out and you have to do something with it <laughs> and we have you know rich cultural protocols on how to care for the placenta you know, they don't know that how many times the baby is going to poop every day and that it's orange or yellow, right? Like, we just, there's so much that is made invisible about birth and postpartum. So everything is like a surprise. <laughs> so part of the work is just mm -hmm. normalizing that, hey, these are the things that are going to happen and, and stop normalizing ice packs, right? Because if, if they know one thing, it's like, I got to get ice packs because my vagina is going to be like really sore. After and, and so it, it's somewhat controversial. And yeah. I have people that are like, but yeah, it helped me so much. It took down the swelling and helped with the pain. And it's like, yeah, for that 20 minutes. But what we're looking for is healing. We need blood flow. We need stem cells, oxygen, nutrients. We need blood cells to get to that area and ice stops the flow right why does the swelling go down it's because all the blood is leaving and we want all of that blood to freely move through the body and cold placed on any part of the body stops the blood flow so it's all about the circulation it's all about preventing that cold so cold might feel good in that 20 minutes and actually i bet for some people it doesn't feel good they just do it because it's expected and you know i teach that there are certain trees and plants that we can make teas out of to spray onto the vagina after birth and i guarantee i've used it myself i've seen it with my own two eyes I like, I swear by these treatments because they bring the tissues back together. They reduce the swelling. They bring any tears back together. It heals the skin, the tissue, and it feels a lot better than having an ice pack on your most tender part of your body. So it's all about, you know, a lot of this sounds completely backwards to how things are <laughs> normally done. So we're truly decolonizing because we're like saying no thanks to the things that harm us in small and in epic ways and saying yes, please, to what heals us and what repairs us and making it normal so that our kids don't think they need to have ice packs. You know, they'll just know that there's another way to heal. Yeah, this is the work of a lifetime, many lifetimes. <laughs> we don't know. Um, you're talking about, you know, deeper healing. Um, and we talk about, you know, the external body maybe. But I wonder, I, I and I haven't heard a lot um, about like healing your womb, healing your nourishing your uterus, because they're, you know, the way placenta separates at birth. I mean, that is like a huge wound, I would guess. I'm wondering, like, how do you you know, bring your practices to heal uh, that part of the body, because I really haven't read much about, you know, how can we, you know, eat for it? Or are there, yeah, there's like a lot said, of wisdom you know, to learn there. And actually, in my online class, 
the first module is all about protecting the health of the womb. And it's the foundation of our healing. So it really is the center of our healing. And the reason is because once cold is allowed or able to enter into the womb, it can prevent us healing on a physical level and on an emotional level. Because what happens is, and you'll hear people say things like, I feel really disconnected. I feel like I'm not able to really connect with my baby. Or I feel like I'm above my life, looking down on it, watching it happen. It creates, literally, it cuts the connection or severs the connection between our mind and our body. Our gut feeling, our womb is in our gut. And so when we say gut feeling, we're talking about our womb. And so we want to protect that you know, by any means necessary in the postpartum period. And so it starts as soon as the placenta is born. And I used to talk about the placenta as being a wound, but I stopped talking about it as a wound because a wound is an injury and our bodies are innately wise and intelligent. So our bodies don't seek to injure itself in a way that we could bleed to death, you know, especially when we have a new baby. So that tissue is specially and perfectly designed to hold the placenta and it's perfectly designed to release the placenta and it's perfectly designed to close back together to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. And so we expect to see some pretty heavy bleeding in the first few days after birth but honestly we should see that decrease pretty significantly in the first week and the definitely the first uh, that's the second week after baby comes. So there are herbs that we can drink to support that healing process. Those open veins and arteries are starting to shrink down. They're starting to close and that tissue is regenerating. And so there's a lot of foods that we can use to support that happening. There's a lot of ways we can get in the way of that healing. You know, if we're really agitating the womb by touching it a lot. And what do you see right after right after the placenta is born? What's the first thing that the nurses do? They come up and push on it, right? So we're, we're already like, we're already getting in the way of that healing that the body is naturally and wisely wanting to do, right? There's, there's no protocol for massaging or touching the womb at all. <laughs> all of that healing comes from within. And so I'll share just a couple of the things that we do to support that healing process besides leaving it alone. One is bone broth. And bone broth is so amazing for so many reasons. But part of what it helps us to do is to kickstart our body to make collagen. And collagen is like the foundation of our cells and our tissues. It's what brings us together and allows us to like exist rather than just be like floppy, you know, skin sacks. <laughs> you know, like what brings us together? It's part of what brings us together, our, <laughs> our ligaments, our tendons. And so we're we're introducing bone broth because all of that rich collagen, all of the minerals that comes from that bone marrow is so supportive to those tissues. And so the tissues will just start regenerating and you'll see that bleeding decrease pretty significantly. So if I see someone who's still bleeding really heavily, three, four, five, six, seven weeks postpartum, that's a red flag to me that their tissues are still in there, just raw and open and their body's not been able to close off and start to regenerate that uterine lining. And it could be for a lot of reasons. It could be because they're eating a lot of cold food. It could be because they're, you know, they've been pushed on, they're agitating, maybe they're up and they're being too active. So those muscles literally going like this and just rubbing up against itself. You know, it could be because they're they have a, a three-year-old who's constantly jumping on them. You know how kids are, you know, they're not getting Place to heal. And, and so a lot of it has to do with just <laughs> resting, you know, um, eating and drinking 
the culturally appropriate foods, bone broth being the number one. And there's lots of other things too, but a lot of it's just leaving it alone, (laughs) you know, just letting the body do what it needs to do. And stop normalizing bleeding for two (laughs) months, you know, it's not normal. We we should only be bleeding heavily for a week and then spotting for a few more weeks after that as everything comes back together. But the body wants to come back together very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah no this is so great to kind of think about you know what did our ancestors do in our own traditions and you know using these philosophies to sort of question be curious and start digging around you know we all come from histories of this knowledge so I think I hope people are inspired you know not just to sort of say oh I'll do what you know Ayurveda does or, or I'll do you know whatever um is out there but really kind of question from their um own family like what did my grandparents use like what was their you know version of the bone broth or what herbs they use uh i think it's just so empowering to get in touch with you know what speaks to you Um, well um i'm just so grateful thank you for sharing your wisdom um and yeah it's just so inspiring to hear you speak um, well, I'm really curious to just hear a little bit more about your class so people can. Yeah, uh, so I have an eight week fully online in. postpartum traditions class, and it's a BIPOC only space, so it's open to Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And it's a really amazing space because we share. A lot like the foundation of the class is Anishinaabe postpartum care. So we start with the immediate moments after birth, how the new person is to be treated, what foods and drinks they are to be given, how we are to conduct ourselves as a community during that time. Why is birth ceremony? Why is postpartum a rite of passage? What does that even mean? And then we work our way up through the first six weeks. And I share with you some of the plants and trees that are common to my culture and this land, how they are used, how they are harvested, how we can start to have a relationship with them, and some of the stories behind them that come from our history, our oral tradition. And I weave in my own personal experiences too, so you can actually see and visualize and like put yourself in the mind of what it means to not be cared for and then what it means to be cared for. And the foundation of this, like I said, is the plants, the trees, and the foods. So we talk a lot about traditional foods. I show you how to prepare them. I have a huge amazing, beautiful recipe guide that takes you through all of the first things, all the way up to getting back to a normal, regular postpartum diet. What are those traditional herbs? We go through how to prepare baths because baths are Uh, customary to our tradition and there's certain trees and herbs that we use and I'll show you how to do that and part of the beauty of this space is that we are able to do a lot of our own healing of our birth stories both literally our own birth as in how we emerged into the world because we carry that story with us we carry it into how we interact with the world whether we know that or not So we do a little excavating of our own stories. We do a lot of healing of our own birth and postpartum stories, our stories of loss, our stories of abortion, our menstrual cycle stories. We really dive into that because it's important into how we show up for others. And so it's very much rooted in Anishinaabe traditions, and it's designed to help anyone who comes to this space to feel confident enough to go out and and bravely and confidently and with a great deal of integrity start to provide one to four days of specialized postpartum care to families of newborns and to people who have experienced perinatal loss. So we talk about grief and loss. We talk about 
uh, bereavement practices, what the protocols are, how to deal with that, how to help families move and navigate through grief. We really go, we go there. <laughs> and so it's a place. When you leave the class, I want you to feel like you have had this medicine within you all along and it just takes a little nudging and a little encouragement and skilled facilitator to draw it out of you so that you can hit the ground running, you know, because postpartum care is essential. It always has been. We needed postpartum care providers like yesterday. <laughs> and so this class is designed to connect you to your roots, connect you to your medicine so that you can go out there and start sharing it. Wow. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to the baths. And yeah, I think I'm really moved by uh, the fact that we'll be sort of, you know, inquiring our own births and sort of how we kind of embody that. So I'm really interested in just like digging a little deeper um, and hopefully, you know, there's some dreams, there's answers. So I'm really looking forward to that. And where can we find you in the internet world? <laughs> yes, for sure. My business name is Postpartum Healing Lodge. And you can find me on Instagram at Postpartum Healing Lodge, all one word, no underscores. And I'm super active on there. I always tell people my Instagram is like a free class in and of itself because I'm dropping hella knowledge in there all the time. And my website is postpartumhealinglodge.com. And so if you're interested in learning more about how you can work with me and how we can learn from each other, then go on there and look for my classes. And I have an email list that I highly recommend everyone sign up for because I treat my email list really amazingly. I always get first dibs to sign up for my classes, usually with really significant discounts. And I share a lot of stories and stuff on my email list as well. And I have a freebie when you sign up for my email list uh, via my website which is nine postpartum recipes, some meals and some drinks and teas that are traditional to my family and to my culture. So you sign up at postpartumhealinglodge.com and you'll get a bundle of recipes for free that you're welcome to print out and start trying right away. Great, thank you so, so much. <laughs> How can you bring something sacred to your current window of time? What do you have to offer to someone within their sacred window? We honor you for all you give and for who you are. Thank you for listening. The Sacred Window Podcast is brought to you by the Center for Sacred Window Studies. You can visit us to find out more about our online training and mentoring programs, plus resources and products for and about the sacred postpartum window at www.sacredwindowstudies.com. Editing of our podcast recordings is done by Sienna Butler, and our music is written and performed by Sarah Emmett. You can hear more of Sarah's music by visiting www.sarahemmett.bandcamp.com.